When Robert Mueller's office recommended that Michael Flynn not serve any jail time despite lying to the FBI, the decision stunned many in Washington and beyond. At the time, Mueller's team said that the man who was fired from his job as President Trump's national security advisor provided substantial assistance in the investigation. Well, today we're learning a bit more about exactly what those two words mean, because it wasn't just Flynn's phone calls with Russians that interested Mueller. Listen to this. It was also contacts from people with ties to the Trump administration and to Congress. Communications that Mueller says focused on how Flynn might cooperate with him. Contacts that had the potential to obstruct the investigation. CNN's Kara Scannell is in Washington for us. And so, Kara, a judge has ordered transcripts of these conversations released in a couple of weeks. What else do we know right now? Yeah, Brooke, so in a couple of weeks, we might actually see the transcripts of this of this voicemail recording and even possibly the audio of that. But what we've learned from this unredacted portion of Michael Flynn's sentencing memorandum that was released yesterday was that Flynn was cooperating with the special counsel's office in a much broader way than we knew, that he was providing them information about contacts that he and his attorneys had received from people associated with the administration and Congress that occurred both before he pled guilty and after he pleaded guilty. And special counsel's invest uh, Mueller says that this was all going toward Flynn's cooperation and it was something that they were looking at as to whether it had influenced his decision or the breadth of his cooperation. Now, there's this recording that is also referenced in the Mueller report where one of the president's personal attorneys contacted a lawyer from Michael Flynn and had a conversation with him just after Flynn told them that they were no longer going to be operating under a joint defense agreement. And this voicemail is the one that we might actually get to see the transcript of, but it all factored into this obstruction question that Mueller's team was investigating. They said that they did mm -hmm. not talk to the president's attorney about this because of issues of attorney-client privilege. So they couldn't determine the president's intent here. Was he even aware of this conversation? And was he involved in it? And this leaves us with some still unanswered questions of, did Mueller's team investigate any of these individuals, either associated with Congress or the administration, about whether they were trying to obstruct justice? Or could this possibly be something that is in one of those many 14 referrals that are still redacted from the report? So even though we've learned quite a bit of information here, there are still some open questions about how this factors into the broader picture of obstruction. Brooke. Okay, so on obstruction and this voicemail, uh, I want to pivot forward. Kara Scannell, thank you for the reporting. I've got Gloria Borger. She's our CNN chief political analyst and CNN legal analyst, Eli, Eli Honig. He's a former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. Good to see both of you and Eli Honig. How is this not obstruction of justice? <laughs> I'm going to argue that it is. Not surprisingly, given my prosecutorial background. Yep. But I think looking at this from any perspective, it has to be obstruction of justice. Let's be clear. Trying to talk somebody out of cooperating with prosecutors is obstruction of justice. And this is textbook obstruction. And when you look at that voicemail, and maybe we'll hear it someday, that'll be really interesting. When you look at it, you see Trump's team, his lawyers, using sort of both the, the carrot and the stick, right? The stick here is it's going to be trouble. There's national vague national security concerns. Mm -hmm. At some other point, one of the lawyers said it would, it would be construed as a hostile act. And then you also see the carrot, the enticement, the, hey, the president still has warm feelings for you. P.S. This is the guy who gives out pardons. They don't say that part, but I think it's fairly well no known. So to me, it's pretty clear obstruction. And, and I think we also need to keep in mind, this is what we're talking about today. This is one puzzle piece in a much larger puzzle on obstruction. There, there are three different witnesses they tried to do this to, and that in itself is one of 11 different acts that Mueller lays out in the report. The carrot and the stick, and Gloria, you, we know that Flynn described uh, multiple times, quote, that he or his attorneys received communication from persons connected to the administration or Congress that could have affected both his willingness to cooperate and the completeness of that cooperation, end quote. And my question to you is, when I read this, members of Congress? Right. Well, we don't know. You know, th these could be people who were allies of the president. I think the big question here, and I think Ellie touches on it, is what did the president know about all of this? And that's what we as, don't know, right? And that's right. And as Mueller, you know, Mueller pointed out, you know, in his report, he said, 
Um, these sequence of events could have had the potential to influence uh, Flynn's decision about uh, cooperating as well as the extent of the cooperation, but because of privilege issues, they right. didn't pursue it. They couldn't pursue it. So these are questions right now that, that we just don't know the answer to. And I'm not a lawyer. Ellie <laughs> is. I don't think you are, Brooke, right? <laughs> but I, I think the I'm question not. is, in a, in a phone call in which you had a joint defense agreement, wouldn't it just be simple to ask the question, are you now cooperating with Mueller? Thanks right. very much. Please call me back. End of, end of uh, voicemail. Wouldn't that have been the way to do it? All right, to the JD. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, well, I'll give you a non a common sense answer, which I think the lawyer was trying to be cagey here. I think he was yeah. not. I think he was smart enough to not just come out and say, "Hey, you better not cooperate." I yeah. think every lawyer knows not to do that. But look at that voicemail. That's the way real life people. He was being commute. intentionally nebulous. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this whole privilege issue does not fly with me because anytime there's a privilege, attorney-client privilege in some states, spouses, if, if the conversation that's normally privileged goes to a crime, here, obstruction, privilege goes away. So I'm not buying that. I okay. don't follow that. Gloria, here, here's the really rich tweet that, that we have to talk about, and you know where I'm going. Because moments ago, President Trump tweeted that he had no idea Michael Flynn was under investigation and couldn't make a staff change because no one warned him. And my response is... Uh, no one? <laughs> Not former FBI Director James Comey? Not former De Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates? Not you know, former President Barack Obama? I mean, you, go ahead, Gloria. Well, uh, you're right. I'll, I'll I mean, there, are, there are two parts of this, uh, and let me add to your list. The part is, before he became president, which is, I think, what he might be referring to during the transition, of course, Barack Obama said to him, you know, he's a bad guy. Uh, so did Chris Christie. Remember, Chris Christie, before he was fired as head of the transition, didn't have a job for Michael Flynn, thought he was, thought he was a bad guy, and didn't want the administration to hire him in any way, shape, or form. But then he got fired, and guess what? He became national security advisor. I think Congressman Cummings also told Mike Pence, don't touch this guy, he's bad. Then, of course, after Trump became president, that's when you have the Sally Yates involvement, rushing to the White House, meeting with Don McGahn, and then McGahn uh, talking to the president directly about about Flynn's uh, lying. So I think you have the before and the after he became president. I think he knew, but he didn't want to listen. What do you think? Uh, th just those people? That's all that told them? Yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> it, it doesn't stand up to the facts. I think Gloria just knocked that argument right down. Um, Mueller laid out 11 examples of potential obstruction of justice by President Trump. What do you make up, just separately before I let you all go, of, of Chairman Adler's handling of all of it? Uh, not exactly a profile in courage or leadership. I think his leadership thus far has been weak and directionless. Mueller gave uh, Don't Congress. hold back, Ellie. Jeez. <laughs> Don't hold back. Mueller gave Congress this overwhelming quantity of evidence on obstruction. And here we are about a month out from the release of the report, and Congress has really done nothing. Nadler sent out this blanket request for 81 different people for information, got nothing back, didn't stand his ground. Bill Barr walked out on the House, refused to, to, to show up. All we got was a committee member eating fried chicken. So here we are. We, he's got, he's done He's brought in no witnesses. He has not backed up his subpoenas by going to court. He needs to take a stand and he needs to choose a direction here. 